Good morning. Um, Bastian, can you just share the content there? That'd be great. Awesome. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CommuniCloud's latest webinar, uh, Confessions of a Hacker. Before we get started, can I just cover a couple of um, housekeeping topics? So at the end of the session, we will be opening up to a question and answers forum. So during the, um, the actual presentation, if you want to, in your chat box at the bottom of the screen, there should be uh, the ability to just throw your questions into there. We'll try and cover as many of those as we can. Uh, at the end, if not, we can always follow up afterwards as well. Uh, the last part is we are recording this. Um, so if any of you guys have to drop off during it, we will be sending the recording out to everyone who registered for this. So um, expect that at the end of the, the forum. And also, please feel free to share it with anybody else that you've got. Um, so first of all, I'd like to give everyone a big thank you uh, for giving us time in your diary today. I know everyone's busy. Um, but we are really excited to have you here with us and also with Bastian and um, this webinar. Um, without much further delay, let me give a big warm uh, welcome to Bastian Treptel, co-founder of uh, Control Group and Reformed Hacker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to covering off some topics today on how much the threat landscape we're seeing in everyday technology use is really affecting people and ruining their lives and also finding out more about how the community cloud solution can help uh, thwart some of our attacks. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Bastian Treptel. I'm a reformed hacker, co-founder of CTL Group, and also have a podcast, Cyber Hacker. Uh, like it says, a reformed hacker, but now I spend most of my time looking for new threats out there in the wild and trying to protect businesses. And in terms of uh, how I actually got into this, uh, unfortunately for my mother, uh, at the age of 14, I managed to uh, break into one of the big four banks and uh, steal around 40,000 credit card numbers. Look, the only thing that I ever did was uh, order a few pizzas, which uh, landed me in some hot water with the federal police. Uh, but I've turned a new leaf now, and, and as I said, I'm working to protect businesses. And that mainly stemmed from seeing how much cybersecurity can really impact individuals. So at around the age of uh, 19, I saw one of my friend's families go through a, a cyber breach where uh, their bank accounts were essentially emptied. Um, and whilst they were insured, the, the period of time for the insurance money to pay out meant they couldn't pay wages and their business, uh, a small chemist business, uh, went under. So it does affect people even way back then. And now I'm working with a lot of major corporations around Australia to protect them and stop those things from happening which is uh, far more interesting work, and it means I don't have to look over my shoulder the whole time. So how does hacking change from where it was all those years ago to compare to where it is now? So a lot of people perceive hackers to be, you know, guy in a hoodie with his, um, in his mother's basement and uh, script kiddies, those sorts of things, but it really has changed now to organised crime. So something like 73% of cybercrime is now based in organised crime. There were the figures from 22 from the Verizon report. And we had uh, a really great opportunity to meet some of these organised criminals. So we went to uh, uh, Southeast Asia and we were really surprised to see how mature these organisations were. I'm talking a four storey high building, 180 staff, HR managers, sick leave, training, predominantly female call centre, uh, psychologists that had been trained at universities in Australia writing scripts. And at the time we were there, they were going after real estate agents, small businesses. Some 30 to 40% of cyber attacks in Australia are perpetrated against small businesses by organisations like this. Now, when we went and spoke to the government, we, we, were asked, we asked them, you know, why aren't you shutting these things down? And their response were, these organisations are set up in poor socioeconomic areas, they pay their taxes, and they're employing a bunch of people and we're turning a blind eye. And when we spoke to the, the gentleman who was running the centre, he literally thought that Australians, everything was insured, there was no harm, no foul. So that's really what we're up against. Uh, gone are the days where it's just me uh, in my basement uh, attacking businesses and, and really ordering a few pizzas. You really are up against some 
really well thought through, well prepared, well funded adversaries that are looking to go after your business these days. Now, some of the attacks these guys are using are getting very advanced as well. If you've heard of deep fakes, deep fakes being the ability to very quickly mimic someone's voice. So imagine you get a phone call from your CEO or your, or your accounts payable person. It sounds like them. You've got an email to back up that they're about to call you. They verify the phone call. Deep fakes are making a huge splash in Australia. We've recently seen a financial planner uh, get hit by a deep fake using messenger audio where she advised uh, her accountant that she was away on holidays, which she was. The attacker was already in the system. And then the attacker used a deep fake voice print to advise her accountant to send over $106,000 Australian. Money gone, insurance bust. Spear phishing, cache poisoning, denial of services, router hackings, malware, ransomware, we've all heard of it. It's getting rather advanced the attacks that we're seeing via the web. Uh, invoice scam is huge in Australia. It's probably one of the number one targets. And while we hear this message that data theft is huge in Australia, still 83%, sorry, 86% of attacks in Australia are money-based. So attackers will breach your system, whether it be your email systems, they'll look and they'll use a bunch of different tools available to them to try and trick you into wire fraud. So some of the tools, and this is one of my favorite parts of the talk, some of the tools that are available to hackers these days are phenomenal. Gone are the times where you need to be hugely technical, whether you need to know how to code. You can go online now for as little as $90 American US dollars and pay an attacker to take out a database for you. So you get a bunch of uh, a database, whether it be uh, from your phone or you buy it from a, a database agency, and you upload that file for them, they will profit share the amount of money they make out of that database with you. And they do pay out. As, as strange as it sounds, they're actually semi-legitimate businesses. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of uh, the OMG USB, but one of our favorite attacks when we go out and, site and, and go and attack a company in what we call a, a, a social engineering attack is to use the OMG USB. Now, everyone loves a free phone charger. We will set up and pretend to be the red cross out the front of a business and we give away these free phone chargers. If you plug in one side to your laptop, it gives us a remote access shell to your laptop. If you plug in the other end to your mobile phone, it gives us remote access to all your contacts and database in there. 50,000 of these OMG USBs were sold and I guarantee they didn't all go to training organizations like us. Gone are the days where you had to even open an email to get hit. You need to have software running on your system to do that for you. Drive-by scripts are becoming prolific. We've just got our hands on some amazing new code recently that the preview window will allow us to inject malware, deploy worms, sniff out your system. New age phishing techniques, gone are the days again where you're looking for spelling mistakes, domain spoofing has become rife, caching has become rife. So you really have all these systems at your fingertips as a hacker to break into an organization. And particularly if you let a bad guy into your premise, they're gonna come through you like Swiss cheese. You need to train your staff in social engineering. A great tip that we give out to uh, all the people who listen to these seminars and, and come and talk to us at CTRL Group is if you don't recognize someone at your work, have a secret passphrase. It might be as simple as how was your weekend? And everyone in that organization knows to answer that in a specific way. You might have to just say the color purple and then answer the question for real. If someone doesn't know to say the word purple, go and contact your security teams. Particularly in the small business space, it's uh, very easy to see contractors and things come through and it's just expected to be normal. Any one of those guys can be a hacker. Skimmers, RFID clones. We have a lot of fun with software defined radios opening and closing garage doors. If anyone's unfortunate enough to own a Ford right now, there is a glitch in your key system, which means we can reset your key pass and open your doors at will. So there's lots of amazing research tools and toys available to hackers these days that allow us to essentially come through organizations if you're not well trained and if you don't have the right software and defenses in place. So let's deep dive a little bit into these. So domain spoofing. 
A great example is if you've got any kind of one or I or L in your domain, you need some kind of system checking to make sure that it is a legitimate domain. So we, we offer a bunch of services that look up these things before it even gets to your inbox. And I know Stephen's going to talk to you about some of these services that can protect your inbox, can protect you from domain spoofing. Phishing emails. Now, a lot of us have a bunch of information about ourselves on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on all these social media platforms. Hackers are getting very clever about correlating a database of things they know you do. It might be that you go to Virgin Active Gyms. It might be that your subscription to Netflix is expiring. They're getting very clever. They're getting very well written. And as I said, they're using psychology, university trained psychologists to target you. And as we said before, it's all pushing towards that wire fraud. Some 86% of attacks are all basically trying to get information out of your system to allow them to conduct wire fraud. And we've seen some tragic examples of that in Australia, upwards of a million dollars or more transferred overseas uh, for small businesses, which is, as you would know, crippling and often not covered by insurance. So why should you care? 43% of cyber attacks are aimed at CMEs, but only 14% are prepared to defend themselves. So the days where if you had a firewall and you had an IT guy and suddenly the IT guy's responsibility is cybersecurity and the garage doors and the VoIP phone system, it just doesn't cut the mustard anymore. You need a fully fledged internet protection system, endpoint detection response, email protection systems, uh, network intrusion protection systems, a whole raft of controls that are honestly very well priced um, compared to what they can cause your business in terms of damage. So we want to raise that figure up. 14% in Australia with that she'll be okay attitude. We haven't been hacked before. Really isn't going to cut it anymore. And Aus Cyber released some information uh, last year that one in three Australians are affected by cybercrime. So it's time that we get our act together and, and sort this issue out. So some examples of some poor organisations that have been hit really hard. Uh, Heat Group was hacked. It cost the business $2 million. The, comp the backups were compromised. So an attacker has breached their network. Now attackers don't usually just come into a network, do their business and leave within hours or minutes. They're often in there for days, if not weeks. So this poor organization, they were in there for 130 days. They were still getting the backup successful, but it was clearing the tapes. All data was found for sale on the dark web, and then they crypto locked the thing. Also, it's time that businesses take responsibility. So ASIC actually sued the financial services company, Riot Advice Group, where hackers spent 155 hours logged in without any kind of detection. Now that affected 226 client groups and that affected their clients as well. So it's a huge rolling chain effect just because they hadn't had a few controls in place. Something as simple as patching regularly, as having the right endpoint detection and response systems, as having some email protections is all it takes to thoroughly protect an organization. And nine times out of 10, it's, it almost brings tears to my eye how simply it could have been prevented. Right hotel is attacked via email. So business email compromise is not like it used to be when I did it back in the day, where I would compromise one email server and look for what I would call at-risk conversations, perhaps between a bookkeeper and a business owner. Now we have applications that will tell us of the 500 emails that went in and out today, here are five, which is a machine learning algorithm that Bastion, we think you should have a look at and is interesting. And it'll tell me things like, can we approve this? Can we transfer that? Email is a completely unsecured system. You should never be telling someone via email to transfer money or approving a transaction or onboarding someone or even doing something as simple as training by email can be very dangerous. For example, we recently did a red team exercise against an organization and we went onto LinkedIn found out that the bunch of staff had just started three months ago. We managed to break into their email systems. We found they were being trained over email. Fantastic place for us to find out how the ERP systems, how payments worked, how we onboarded a new client. 
we onboarded ourselves as a new supplier. We found a hole in their system where supplies didn't have to be approved if they were outside of projects. We learned all that via email and social media, and we managed to transfer out $100 a day for 30 days with no one noticing. Now, obviously, $100 a day is not going to affect anyone, but a, a hacker could do a much larger sum and pretty frightening kind of stuff. These guys uh, write hotels. The bookkeeper transferred a million dollars to an account in China. Patco Construction, a Trojan, captured banking credentials and made a series of money transfers. They lost nearly $600,000 in seven days. Those kinds of attacks are very easy to prevent if you've got the right tools and protections in place. Now, if you went for a targeted attack, obviously it's more, it's more difficult to prevent you from getting hit. But the question asked to me today, if I was a former black hat, how would I hack an organization? How would I hack an SME to go after a prize pool of somewhere between say a hundred and $600,000? And a little hint here, I'd probably go after it in multiple ways. So again, looking at all the tools that are available to me today, I can use things like Harvester, I can use machine learning, I can use automation. So I've pre-written a bunch of scripts that is going to target individuals like yourselves and make no mistake, every single person who works at an organization has some level of access. Now, if you have a level of access, you are interesting to me because you can get into the organization and I want your access. So using automated tools, I get a bunch of intelligence that tells me you work at the organization, how long you've been at the organization, uh, perhaps what your partner's name are, what your dog's names are, pets, animals, your trends, your habits, your favorite football teams. And these applications now go and tell me that this is gonna be a good target. Hasn't been at the organization long, uh, likes the Hawks, uh, likely to have a password key set in this range. So how many of you are guilty of having a password that is your partner's name, your date of birth, your kid's name, your dogs? So as a hacker, I'm trying to reduce the amount of keys that I have to guess your password with. So anyway, now I have a bunch of information on your organization and it's like a Sudoku puzzle. When you're posting things to social media, just think, is this piece of information a breadcrumb that a hacker could use against me? Has it got my identity? Have you got photos that literally have geotagging that tells me where you live and where you go to work? Once I've got all this information, I'm gonna to move to social engineering. So hacking these days is usually a combination of some kind of social engineering, like grabbing information off social media sites and then mixing that with technical knowledge. So I might impersonate someone in your network. I might want to make an appointment to get into your building. I might ring up and say, hey, we're the fire guys. We want to test the smoke detectors. When someone makes a phone call like that, make sure that you verify their credentials. You go to their website, you ring them back on a number that they say they're from and say, hey, uh, this guy, Bastion, says he's coming in to test smoke detectors. Is it legit? Because again, once we are inside your building, it's very hard to capture us, stop us, and stop us doing some real damage. If I'm feeling shy, I'm going to use email. I'm going to use phishing techniques. I'm going to use SMS. I'm going to use all the information that I know about you to get into your organization. I'm going to test the waters. Can I have a conversation with you and just about nothing and see if you reply back to me? If it does, if you do, you, we've already started communication and dialogue. We recently did a test with uh, Barracuda Sentinel systems and in one particular organization, the CEO was talking to the CFO, except for the CEO wasn't the CEO. And they'd been talking for three months. And it was very clear the attacker was gearing up to get the CFO to transfer some money. This gets back to some of the protections that Stephen is going to talk about later. But unfortunately, a lot of people have misconfigured small business environments to allow me to get cracks and hashes outside through your firewall. So what that means is if I fail in my social engineering techniques, I will send you a phishing email and that phishing email will have a malformed server request. So you might have a server on site or a server in the cloud that's double backslash server zero one. I'll misspell server and then I'll have a man in the middle attack on the internet 
And it, essentially your device will send me your username and your password in a hash. Now there are services online that will crack the password for me in a matter of minutes if you make it easy. So if your password, for example, is uh, less than seven digits, if you don't have any special characters, or I've already managed to grab what I think the characters would be from your social media, usually we can crack someone's password in an organization within three hours. That's just not good enough. We should have 14 digit character passwords and you should be using something like LastPass or OnePass to make them complex so you don't even have to remember them. I actually don't know any of my passwords and not one of my passwords is the same as anything else, but it's easy for me because I'm personally, I'm using LastPass. So correctly configuring, correctly having the, the right software running and protections and detection, having your network monitored would stop this particular attack. Once I've got a username and password, once I'm into your network, whether it be physically or by social, I'll execute some kind of backdoor. So this is where I'm gonna get payday a few times over. So I will deploy another way for me to get in your environment, whether it's installing Teams on a server that I get access to or a backdoor system or a Trojan that comes back or a shell that comes back to our office. Essentially, even if you detect me on the first pane, I'll have multiple ways to get in. And sadly, a lot of organizations, when they get hit by ransomware, they'll find the first point of entry, but they won't find the software that's been installed by the hacker that allowed them in the second time. Now, this happened to, unfortunately, Toll Group, where they got hit twice in a row. So once I've got access, this is where I'm going to deploy malware. I'm going to instantly download all the data that I can find, PI information if you haven't obfuscated it, financial information, IP of your business, and I'm going to instantly sell that online. My next port of call is probably going to be to check to see if your systems are patched and I'm going to deploy some malware that's going to work against your systems at your patch level. So if you don't have the patches set to within a week or so, so you, you should be patching at least every week, that'll allow me to deploy some malware and I'm going to ransomware your entire environment. If I'm feeling particularly nasty, I'll also go after your backups and I'll encrypt your backups or just roll them over so that you get the message each day saying, successfully backed up, but it's actually deleting your old backups. And then, and then at that point, it's open to me. I can demand payment, sell your data on the dark web. And once your data is sold on the dark web, you're six times more likely to be hit again and again and again. And that's not only the business owner or the business. If you work for an organization, you're also more likely to get hit again. So it's very important that everyone who has access to an organization realizes that it's not going to just impact you at home. It's going to hit you. Sorry, not just going to hit you at work. It's going to hit you at home as well. So let's get on to how we would actually stop this. So I don't know if I'm a little bit strange and I've been told that I am. So there you go. Every job that I've ever had, I've always had a bit of a think to myself, how would I steal money from this organization? How would I get this information out? How would I get this data out? And you know your job better than anyone else. So you know if there's little holes in the system. Can you log into any systems that have critical data without two-factor authentication turned on? Can you log into a system from home and it's actually easier than doing it from the office? Nine times out of 10, people who are involved in breaches said they felt a bit weird, you know, something was a bit wrong, but then they were convinced to do it anyway. So look for weaknesses in your role, look for weaknesses in your business, Think like a hacker. If I knew what I knew, could I get information out? Could I get money out? And go and talk to your MSPs, go and talk to your IT departments and block those holes. It makes our job a lot harder to break in. Awareness. Just talking about cybersecurity, coming to seminars like this, deploying the right tools around your network is your best defense. And developing an understanding of configuration and vulnerabilities by using organizations like us and CommuniCloud to actually find out where your weaknesses are. That is going to stop a hacker. Hackers are fairly lazy people. If there's easier low lying fruit next door, we'll go next door. If this basket looks a bit too hard, we'll, we'll move away from it. Also going to cover off quickly why people are left vulnerable. It goes back to that misprice of data rest. And what that means is you misprice the value of your access to an organization. A cleaner might think, why would a hacker target me? But a cleaner has after hours access to a building. 
So if I really want to mount a targeted attack, I'm going to go and get a job at this cleaning organization and I'm going to dump a bunch of USB key loggers, wireless access points in the environment to give me access the next day when I get out. Lack of awareness. A lot of people just think they're not going to get hit because they haven't been hit before. In fact, after this seminar, I urge a lot of you to go to the website, have I been porn, P-W-N-E-D, and see if you've been part of a breach. Most of the time, if you put your email address in there, you already have been part of a breach. So you're not even aware that past username and passwords are out there on the dark web. In Australia, we're particularly vulnerable to be easily manipulated. Everyone wants to help in Australia, and we generally are very helping uh, to hackers trying to get into an organisation, which is not great. Lack of risk and governance, not proactive in updates. The big attack we saw against Australia uh, from China was updates that were generally about a year old. Yet thousands of small businesses got hit. If you haven't updated your systems for a year, you're kind of asking for it. And using free non-proprietary software, a lot of us are guilty of using apps like um, the Face app, where we like to see how old we're, we're looking. A lot, of these time, a lot of the time, these apps are actually introducing malware to our phones. So cybersecurity is not a role or a title, it's a collective mindset. Everyone in the organization, like I said, from the cleaners to the bosses, to everyone who does all the important jobs in the organization to make it run, have to have a collective mindset on cyber. So I'm gonna hand over to Stephen now, and he's gonna tell us a bit about the primary attack vectors and how Community Cloud's offering can really help. And an interesting point, the, the attack that I walked us through before would be thwarted by this system. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Bastian. And again, thank you very much for your time this morning. That was great. Look, over the last, um, I would say, 12 months, obviously with COVID going on, we've seen a big change, obviously, in, in organizations within Australia and globally. So what we've, what we've looked at and what we're all obviously aware of is we've seen this massive shift of organizations pushing people to remote working or some sort of hybrid working environment with red teams, blue teams, people coming in one week on, week, one week off, et cetera. Now, most organizations um, do or did have enabled the ability to work from home. However, what they struggled with really was the, the fact that it wasn't normally on the scale of the whole organization moving to home. So there were the challenges on that or just some part of the organization of, um, who had access to certain systems could be enabled to work from home. Now, with that first uh, push, and obviously us all going into lockdown, we saw a lot of organizations trying to work out how do we actually enable connectivity? So how do we push our employees in, into their home to be able to connect to the systems and platforms that they need to on a daily basis? Um, and then also, how do we make them efficient, communicate all the usual bits and pieces? Now, we all know, obviously, when we're running a project, you kind of have that wonderful triangle of time and planning and price. Uh, well, the timeline on this was obviously incredibly short, so some things had to go out the window. So what we found across organizations is this, this push to enable um, users to work remotely. They've normally, uh, security has been kind of a hindsight for this. It's a case of let's enable them, get them up and running, because obviously the organization still needs to operate. Um, but we'll, we'll work out how how the back end security works a little bit later on. We've got a few things in place, but we think we're going to be good. Um, so we've seen this transition. That's meant a lot of things as well to, uh, especially IT managers and people managing IT systems, is that their budgets for the year has pretty much gone out of the window. So all of the funds that they had for doing certain projects kind of got halted. Let's then um, reallocate that to enabling these users and, and making sure that we can actually still operate in, a, in this remote working environment. Now, Hopefully, and fingers crossed, we're kind of returned to some form of normalcy here in Australia. Um, it's obviously still not there, but we're seeing organizations going back into the office. And um, it may not be the same working scenarios as what we had originally. And some of this may have changed, um, obviously, to, to allow remote working on a, a more permanent basis. But we're starting to kind of get over that main hurdle and the technology to enable this communications there. So a lot of organizations now are looking at how do I make sure that obviously the, the loopholes or the, some of the security that we kind of bypass to enable this, how do we go back and retrospectively fix this? So um, what we've done at Community Cloud is we, we've kind of had a look and we've been working with our partners at Cisco and, and Abram here to say, okay, these organizations, especially around that kind of small to medium uh, business, small enterprise, that side of it, 
how do we make sure that a we, we can secure those end users um without necessarily bringing them back into the, the corporate network so how do we because a lot of um systems and platforms have been pushed to cloud and uh, vendor um SaaS software um how do we get them to connect securely directly to that rather than coming back through and vpn and into a, a wonderful bottleneck that's uh, normally our it systems um so with that in mind, we've, we've looked at the primary attack vectors, which you've kind of covered today as well. So that's around email security. How do we secure internet services and DNS? How do we make sure the devices that we give our users are actually locked down and we've got malware prevention? And then the last piece, which is how do we actually secure the users? So this is kind of around that user behavior. So most um, attacks, as you're well aware, uh, around about 50% or more are all targeting the individual user. So we can have the best defenses in the world, but if our workforce don't really understand how to have that cyber hygiene mindset, um, people are going to find the way through it. So we brought together, if you just click under the next um, slide there. Awesome. So we brought this bundle together now um, in true community cloud fashion. Um, we're trying to simplify this as much as possible, yeah? So cybersecurity doesn't have to be complex um, through the use of partners like us. So we've brought together the best of um, breeds from security and AVA around secure internet. So um, secure internet gateway and DNS protection around email security. So how do we stop some of that, uh, those phishing and spear phishing attacks? How do we uh, stop the domain spoofing on the, the internet piece? How do we look at making sure our malware is up to date and is getting the latest threat intelligence, not just from in your organization, but across the industry and being applied to it straight away? Um, and the last part is the cyber hygiene piece. So gone are the days where you can give your organization a 20 minute video saying, oh, this is covering some of the aspects that Bassi went today and we're just going to forget about it for a year. And at the end, in, in 12 months times, we, we sit another test, which people probably share the answers to, just to get it uh, over and done with it at the end of the year at Christmas. That's, that's gone now. Cyber hygiene is a, uh, it, it's a change of men, uh, kind of um, tact within your organization. This can't be just an afterthought. So the cyber hygiene piece is how do we then ensure that as users are doing things which are against policy or against your acceptable use policy or doing things which don't really show good cyber hygiene, how do we give them a nudge there and then and train them there and then, which means it sticks in their head. So um, these are all the different solutions that we're looking at that. Again, all on a, on a SaaS basis. So we bundle these together. So it's a per user per month model uh, starting from $24.99 a month. Now, that's a fully proactive managed service. So again, if your IT department, as you mentioned before, all of a sudden have to look after security, sometimes they need a bit of help. This is where we fit in. So we come in and augment the security and the, the IT teams within your organization. We don't necessarily replace. We're here to help. We're here to work and show the latest threats and work with you and how your business is evolving, especially over the next um, kind of 12, 36 months, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're, we've come to market with now. Um, for a limited time, however, we've put this a very aggressive pricing on here as well, because as I mentioned before, a lot of people have had their, their budgets kind of torn apart. They're not sure where to go. They just need, they just know they have to do something now. Um, so up until the end of financial year, we've, we've got this um, offer open um, to market. We will be following up obviously after this with the videos and some information around this bundle. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, send me an email, respond back to the guys. We're happy to come out and talk to anybody around this and some of the other solutions that we put on in, in offer as well. Awesome. Um, so without any further um, delay, I'm gonna hand over to Georgiou who I think has been gathering some of the questions uh, for, for Bastian to answer from our users. I have. Thank you. We've had quite a few come through, so hopefully we have time. Um, here's one. Why do we think business owners are not taking the threat seriously? I think collectively in Australia, whilst the media is doing a great job to let everyone know how serious cybersecurity is, unless you've directly experienced an incident or you know someone very close to you has experienced it, it seems like this fairy tale world that might not happen to you. I put it to everyone who's probably listening to this thinks that, you know, cancer happens to other people and, you know, we're still going to go and have a drink on Friday. And those of you who, who perhaps still smoke, it's just, it's not going to happen to us. And it's that mentality that sort of perpetuates. Um, 
you know, obviously there is uh, some cost associated with responding to cyber and everyone just wants to get on to, with business. But unfortunately, I've seen firsthand and I've literally walked people to administration court uh, or heard some heartbreaking stories of, uh, of probably one of the worst, a winery that's been around for 150 years um, that are no longer with us. So whilst Australians and business owners have that attitude, I think it really is time to change. And uh, hopefully through education events like this and, and the media, we hit a turning point. I think we're about probably two or three years behind America in terms of awareness, um, but we're getting there. Great, thank you. Another one here. What is most difficult for a hacker? Is it getting in or out without leaving a trace? Most of the time, criminal hackers won't care too much about leaving a trace. Uh, these days, they'll be using throwaway interconnections, uh, VPN across the globe, whatever it may be. Getting in um, is definitely probably the, the number one challenge, uh, but it is made a lot easier these days with services and tools and automation. So all these great automations that you have uh, within your businesses, attackers are doing the same thing. So back in the day when I might spend a few days or even weeks trying to get into one organization, um, I'll attack 50,000 organizations looking for a particular vulnerability across Australia, and I'll get a, a series of green dots uh, against IP addresses that tell me they do have that vulnerability, and then I can automate that attack. And then the next day, it'll tell me the ones who are successful, and I have a shell into that environment. So it's really not that target anymore. It's more just uh, the business of making money for hackers. Um, and it really is if you have vulnerabilities that allow that external to internal vector, um, you're, you're going to get walked through like Swiss cheese and it's uh, fairly tragic to see it happen. Thank you. Another one here. As we know, cyber attack is, a, is not a matter of of if, but when you get attacked, do you advise companies to invest more on prevention or detection? Uh, I'd advise companies to probably do a three phase thing. So you need to be able to protect from the large majority of attacks, things like, you know, not patching regularly, things like having endpoint detection response. These are defense and protection mechanisms. Um, it's equally important to have detection mechanisms. So if an attacker is in your system. Um, uh, sadly, a lot of our competitors in Australia, they'll literally pay us as an organisation to come and test uh, security operation centre deployments. So that's organisations like ours that are paid to detect breaches. But we can sit an attacker on a network and scan the network, fingerprint the network, and map the network, and they're not detected. If an attacker manages to get a footprint into your network uh, from a zero day attack, Perhaps your defences won't be able to stand up to a zero day attack, but your detection will be able to detect that it's happening and, and then you can do something about it. And the last piece, the, the third piece of the puzzle is to effectively be able to triage an incident in incident response. So if the worst happens, an attacker comes into your organisation, you want to be able to detect they're there, block their access, verify what they've had access to, have they pulled any information out of your business, do you need to report it to uh, agencies like OIC? Do you have any regular, regulatory requirements? And how quickly can you get back to BAU? So those three pieces, defence, detect and incident response are, are critical in, in different parts. And I'd, I'd say they're all equally important. Great, thank you. Is more and more cloud adoption by companies seen as opportunity or challenges for a hacker? Uh, it's shifted. So if you're targeting an environment, we recently saw Microsoft have the big uh, Microsoft Exchange on-premise breach, which was that critical vulnerability where you have a direct path from the outside world to the inside of your network. Um, that's kind of an older style vulnerability attack. With cloud services, it's more about identity and access management. So can I steal your identity? Because cloud services by nature are available to everyone from everywhere. So it is somewhat an opportunity for attackers to take advantage of identity access management theft and pretend to be someone is a more common style of attack against cloud-based systems, whereas on-prem systems is more, let's find a vulnerability, let's uh, execute that vulnerability and get access to the on-premise system. So but it is a different type of attacking um, and equally as effective and probably opens up the door somewhat. 
Uh, and we're working on systems now as a community cloud to get the computers and the systems and the technologies we use to recognize us as much as we recognize our own parents. Using things like typing patterns, uh, location, IP addresses, biometrics, uh, make it much harder for an attack to actually get the access or your access to the cloud environment. Thank you. Another one here. Many medium and small businesses see cybersecurity as an insurance policy and it is hard to get budgets approved. What is the best way to create a business case to allocate the relevant budget and make investment in cyber technology a higher priority? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, been faced with quite a few boards and things over, over the years that were not too uh, keen to spend on cyber. I would say that uh, businesses these days, particularly small businesses, are asked by and by more and more every day, such as if you want to do business with any of the big four banks, any of the big lenders, uh, any of the government services, you must adhere to some kind of base cyber hygiene to even be able to be tradable with them. So we're seeing the start of that. So if you want to do trade with ANZ, you have to adhere to a cut down version of ISO 2701. So if you sit back and continually think to yourself, okay, we're not going to worry about cyber, we'll do it next year, you'll get to a point where you effectively can't trade with your business partners anymore because they're taking cybersecurity and they won't trade with you if you're not. Another point being that consumers are getting fairly savvy these days. You know, consumers are bending giant organizations like Google and Facebook and even governments all over the world to their will because they want their data to be taken seriously. Individuals are starting to know that if their data is stolen, it impacts their credit rating and impacts their lives for years to come. If they're going to do business with an organization, they want to make sure that you're treating their data seriously. So if you want to continue to trade, you need to take cyber seriously. If you want to continue to attract customers, you need to look after their data very carefully. Uh, the reputational damage can be tragic. And look, it doesn't take much to uh, open up a newspaper and show a lot of these small businesses that aren't here anymore because they've suffered breaches. And that is usually the, the, uh, the technique that we use to, to convince boards that it's a serious matter. Uh, in fact, cybercrime is the number one threat to any organization. Uh, cybercrime makes more money than the adult industry. It makes more money than the drug trade globally. And like you heard me talk about some of these organizations that are targeting Australia, it really is just a matter of when you're going to get hit if you don't take cybersecurity seriously. And that message will hopefully be able to drive change in your organization. But there are absolutely some, uh, some dinosaurs that are very sticky and hard to, to win over, but you just keep drumming that message in and sooner rather than later, they'll start to realize that their bottom line is being affected by not taking cyber seriously. Thank you. How vulnerable are platforms like Slack and Teams chat? Like any application, the developers are doing their absolute best to implement things to protect you. Uh, I would say a lot of the time they're vulnerable because we're not switching on the features that are making them secure. Uh, anyone who's got an Office 365 environment, which includes Teams, you can deploy that um, without two-factor authentication. At our security operations center, um, we monitor our clients who refuse to have two-factor authentication turned on and they're getting hit by thousands of brute force attempts per day. Um, teams, you can configure it poorly, you can configure it well. Uh, look, Microsoft spend a hell of a lot of money on trying to secure their various platforms such as Teams, but like we saw two weeks ago, um, you know, the Exchange platform was vulnerable. There's been Office 365 vulnerabilities. Uh, Zoom literally, I think last week had an issue where if you share your screen with an application, you can actually capture the data on the rest of the screen by using an out of bounds vulnerability. Uh, use everything, not just platforms with a degree of caution. If you have highly sensitive data in your environment and you don't think that should be shared with the world, consider whether you should put that on an application like Teams. Consider more secure forms of communication. Thank you. And do VPNs make it harder for hackers to access your data? VPNs are designed to anonymize where you come from. So VPNs also usually have some kind of a firewall on the other end to, to, to semi-protect you. 
Uh, look, hackers use VPNs more than anyone else, literally to, to hide their identity and, and perpetrate cybercrime. VPNs absolutely have their place if you need to be able to communicate to someone in a country that's got a firewall like China, for example. Um, but the problem with a lot of these VPN services is they're often run by, a, not often, some of them are run by unscrupulous individuals. And if you don't get a very reputable VPN, you're putting yourself at risk that that VPN itself is running malware through your system and uh, using your CPU or graphics card to mine crypto is a really common one for some of the VPN service providers. But if you use a, a, a reputable VPN service, uh, if you deploy it properly, then yes, it can help to protect you somewhat from a hacker. But a hacker is probably not going to come in through the front door like you'd expect them to. They're going to scan you for vulnerabilities, hit you with social engineering, look for credentials that you've already leaked on the dark web, and hit you from multiple angles, usually from the side. For example, so, so one last bit, for example, a VPN won't help you against a business email compromise or a social engineering attack. No worries, Georgia. Is there an end user age group that hackers find more easy, easy to use as access to a business? Yeah, look, unfortunately, um, definitely the, the more elderly uh, people are, they tend to be more vulnerable. There's definitely hackers that go after aged care homes. There's definitely hackers that go after pensions. Um, hackers also, as I said before, go after people who have just started an organization because they can bully them into getting information from them regardless of the age group, but rather how long they've been working at the organization. Um, but yeah, most, most hacks are actually done against the 25 to 35 year old age group because that's predominantly where the workforce sits. And just one more last one, and then we'll, we'll wrap up for today. Should sure. companies invest more on tools or talent in their defense against a cyber attack? Oh, well, great question. So I would say that cybersecurity talent is very expensive. Uh, the zero percent unemployment in the industry. Uh, I hire a bunch of very clever guys and I unfortunately have to pay them way too much, but, uh, I would say that. Tools are going to be a great starting point, but there've been so many organizations that we've gone to and said, oh yeah, this tool actually logged the presence of a hacker and it sent an email to this inbox that no one really monitors other than maybe on a weekly basis. They came in, they came out, they did their damage. Um, you do need to have a mix. If um, hiring in-house expensive talent is just not gonna meet your budgets and it's gonna impact business, then there's some very affordable uh, you know, MSSP solutions out there from organizations like ours, a CTRL group or community cloud that can help you with that MSP component of it. But I think you do need to mix it up. So it has to be tools that are properly monitored by talented people who know what they're doing. And a common mistake that businesses make is trying to get the IT department to look after their cybersecurity for them. The IT department, when we did a survey of seven or eight different businesses here in Melbourne, we figured out they were doing about 23% of their KPI workload because they were doing everything from patching to putting out fires to help their support to all these millions of things, VoIP phone systems, garage doors, integrating new businesses, working on mergers and acquisitions. Their actual work wasn't getting done. If you're then lumping cybersecurity on top, it's just not gonna get prioritized. So yeah, it really is important to, to look at both. And like I said, if it's not affordable to hire your own talent, look at MSSPs. Great. Thank you so much, Bastian. And thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the session and ha have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much, everyone.